Very warm welcome to the Jump to It Christmas special brought to you in association uh, with irishracing.com. I'm Ed Quigley, long shot Ted, and delighted to bring in my esteemed guests, Vincent Finnegan and Stephen Harris. Um, welcome along, gentlemen. Uh, what a feast of action we've got in store. And we're looking at about an eight hour show, uh, I think, coming into, into today's proceedings. We're going to try and uh, kind of bring it down to under the hour, shall we say. So much to look forward to before we get into the action itself. Uh, horse racing world, I think it's fair to say, it's been taking punches from all angles in recent time. But we had a bit of feel-good factor, a bit of festive cheer, I think it's fair to say, Vincent, with uh, Rachel Blackmore winning the BBC's World Sports Star Award in Manchester recently. Uh, I think we'd all agree, nothing less than she deserves. Oh, absolutely. She's been fantastic. It's actually her fourth award in a little over a week, I think. She won a HRI award as uh, an Irish racing hero. She won an Irish Times Sports Woman of the Year over here, and she also won the RTE Sports Person of the Year before. She, that was the day before she won the BBC one. But the BBC one is the big one. There's no doubt about it. That's that's a hell of an award. You just look at some of the names. Like when you, when you roll them off, you've got Pele, Muhammad Ali, Tiger Woods, Usain Bolt, and Rachel Blackmore. It's incredible, mm -hmm. isn't it? We don't think of things in that sort of mm -hmm. sense generally when we're in this little bubble of horse racing. We see her every day. She's just she's just one of the other jockeys as such, but. She's a fantastic ambassador and what she achieved, I, I think we won't know much about it for probably 10, 15, maybe even 20 years. But there's going to be, there's kids watching this today, watching her win her Grand National, watching her in Cheltenham. They're going to see her now over the, the next few days as well. And it's going to change their lives. She, she's going to be an inspiration to them going forward. Some of it's incredible. There's a little aside here, which is just most people know what she's done, what she's won and everything else. But a lovely little thing is there's a local national school here in Kildare called Ratmore National School in Eadstown. And the kids in Fort class were all asked in the writing class to send a letter off to their sporting hero. So they all wrote them off. Nobody heard that in back, but one kid called Frankie sent one to Rachel Blackmore. And mm -hmm. she got a letter back and answered all her questions, wishing them all a happy Christmas, hoping the kids' writing goes well. They even said to the kid called um, Frankie, you've got a cool name and everything else. Like It's just lovely. Mm. And that's the personal side of it. That, that mm. kid is obviously going to be a fan of hers for life. There's no question about that. I don't know whether it's a boy or a girl. I presume it's possibly a boy with a name like Frankie. But boys as well as girls growing up. Like You, you look at the top jockeys that we have um, at the moment. You, you talk to any of them about you know who who was your inspiration. And it could be people like Ruby Walsh's and Paul Carberry's and all those names of the past that inspired them to get involved in Frankie de Tories and everything else. But I think if you if you were a young guy riding now, forgetting the girls for starters, we know they're all going to be in the Rachel camp. But you, you take a guy of 16, 17, 18, he's he's riding pony racing or he's involved in point to points or starting off in racing, and you're trying to look at who's the best out there. She's as good as anybody. The way she rides is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, at just fun point, I was saying by kind of modern day jockey standards, looking at uh, her age, you, you know, you think she's still probably got another best part of a decade to still be around. So she's only going to further enhance her claims and uh, yeah, her popularity continues to blossom. Uh, we must shuffle along. Uh, we're going to get stuck into the action itself, as we mentioned, a whole feast of stuff um, to look at here. And we'll kick off with uh, none other than the King George at Kempton on Boxing Day or St. Stephen's Day for our Irish viewers, I, I should add. Um, absolute belter. The nine due to go to post. Really excited uh, about this assignment, gentlemen. I don't know what you're thinking, but yeah, I mean, generally speaking, uh, if you look at the top of the market, Clan de Zobo uh, in there, vying for favouritism uh, around three to one with uh, the reigning Chatham Gold Cup winner, Manella Indo. Chantry House, five to one. Poke Frodon, uh, last year's winner, of course, at 11 to two. Asterium for Longe, 13 to two. Lost in translation, 14s, uh, and then the rest all a bit bigger. Uh, come to you, uh, Stephen. We're not going to go through each horse um, with their claims, because to be fair, you can make a case of quite a few in here. But I say mm. we'll go to those at the top of the market. Um, if you're going to go Clanders Obo, uh, Manella Rindo, perhaps Frodon, just bring us through what you think of the, which one of the three protagonists you say you think will come out on top. And um, what, what, what do you see as the biggest downside to some of the others in there? What are the, the pros and cons? Well, I really like Frodon here, Ed. Um, I think we won the race last year. Better than ever in Ireland. Bryony booked. I think there's not that much contention on the lead, which will be a big help. And I think Froden will be gunned from the tape, make all the running. He did jump left when he won this last year, but I think he's a pretty straight jumper. I was so taken with his performance in Ireland when he was a few lengths in front of him. 
a five to four favourite that day for that race, so it was presumably thought to be fully fit. Um, I think Frodon at five to one is the bit of value in the race. I think it's a fascinating market race, Ed, actually, because Clandes Obo, um, Paul Nichols has said he's got him fresh and all the rest of it. He's, they're going to come here straight away, first time out. I would be slightly, I think he's sort of making that into a virtue. I very much doubt that he was planning to come here having not had a run if everything was A1 at home. Now, I know the horse got a good record fresh. He's run really well at Kempton before. Obviously, he was beaten behind Frodon last year. But I have my doubts. I suspect from a sort of market-making point of view that Clandes Obo might be a much bigger price than 3-1. to one. I can see him being 5 or 6-1. to one. I think once the Betfair layers have got hold of him, we haven't seen him for a long time. He's also a 9-year-old now. There must be a chance Powers will be on the way. And for all, he hasn't had a lot of racing. I suspect that Manila Endo will probably start a very well-backed favourite. Um, I've got a feeling that decent ground um, will suit. Um, just to touch on that, Ed, I know you like a walk around the course. Sunbury is about a mile away, and it's just starting to rain now. We've got a couple of days of rain forecast. So, you know, we're all thinking good, good to soft at Kempton. It could be soft. It could be quite testing. Again, I doubt that would harm Manello Endo's chance particularly. Uh, whether Clandes Obo wants a slog in the mud, I have my doubts. Frodon, I think, is the solid one. He's going to go off in front. Bryony is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Vincent was saying about Rachel Blackmore, who's an exceptionally good jockey. I think Bryony Frost over a fence is absolutely fantastic. She ekes out those half lengths. So when Frodon won in Ireland, I'm out. Every fence, there was half a length pinched just by being bang on the stride. And I'm hoping Frodon, who I think is around five or six to one, uh, can get us the Christmas money. Yeah, absolutely. Strong case uh, made uh, by Stephen for Frode on there. I think he's uh, off the top. I've just lost the prices, but I think 11 to 2 best price at the time of recording for last year's winner. Uh, we're bringing you Vincent on the Irish Challenge, if you like. Obviously, we've got uh, Styrian Flange and Tornado Flyer as well in the lineup. But Minella Indo, uh, interesting. They put the cheap pieces on for the first time. I presume to try and uh, sharpen them up. Just from my point of view, I mean, listening to Henry de Bromad, he's always said, this horse comes alive at Cheltenham where he grows another leg. Um, three and a quarter miles at Cheltenham. Very different test to three miles around Kempton. You know, one very stamina influenced, one a bit more on speed. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I'm totally on the fence with Manella Indo. If he won this by five legs, wouldn't be shocked. If he finished fourth, I wouldn't say it's the biggest surprise in the world ever. I mean, how do you sum up the reigning Cheltenham Gold Cup winner? I'm a little bit worried about the cheek pieces, personally. That's, that's a definite any of these horses, when you start seeing them putting headgear on, there's a reason for it, and it's a worry. He's, a, he's the reigning Gold Cup champion. That's good enough to win a race like this, surely, but as you say, different track, different trip. That's the key there. Um, for me, I'm in the Stephen camp here. I think just on the basis of the way the, bet, the, the race is shaping up betting-wise, Froden looks a knock and bet each way. Very hard to see Froden out of the first three, realistically. So looking at you getting maybe 11 to 2, maybe 6 to 1, depending on what happens, because you could see a lot of money from Manella Indo. Um, he's the class horse in it, I suppose, ultimately. Clandis Obo, hell of a horse around Kenton as well. No danger there. He's won the race twice before. What did you say? Lack of a run. It's a worry. Asterian Falange is another one. He's a real talent. There's no doubt about it. He's a bit of an enigma. He just can't jump. He literally has no technique over his fences. Um, he proved it the last day with Alaho. He looked like he was coming to challenge there at the third last or whatever and fell. I couldn't have him. I really couldn't. I can't I can't see him get around Kempton. A race is going to be run at a decent pace with Frozen mm -hmm. up front. He'll make a mistake somewhere and that's him out of it. I would have thought it could be something similar to your Shaq on Porsois the last day. That a, a couple of thumping errors halfway through the game and that's the end of him. I, I wouldn't fancy him. And you start looking at some of the others in it. There's, there's a lot of dead wooden here as well, um, horses that you wouldn't expect to see. Tornado Flyer, nice horse, but I don't think really up to this sort of class either. So you're looking at maybe there's only possibly three, four, five horses that are going to have any real chance of being in contention. And Froden is definitely one of them from the front. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the reigning champion, 11 to 2 for Frodon. I'm, I'm with Team Seven Barrows in this. Uh, I like Chantry House. I think he's unexposed. I admit. The level of form he's produced so far is not what the others have produced, yet he hasn't really had the opportunity to do so. You know, he's on a five-timer. If you take the form of his entry run, literally, when he beat Shambaloo 32 lengths and had a fiddler on the roof, another distance behind him, that does look pretty smart in hindsight. And I also think at the prices, uh, Mr. Fisher could run into a place. I, I think Vincent touched upon the pace angle here. 
this is there could be no hiding place if a steering for Lange in the lineup throwed on you watch back to last year's renewal saint calvados was up in the fan uh i can't imagine nila indo is going to be wanted to be ridden for a turn of foot uh, if shall we say so i'd imagine he's going to be pretty prominent like he was in the gold cup as well so this could be a bit of a, a pace burn up if you like and i do think something like mr fisher at a huge price of 40 to 1 uh if he ran on into third would not shock me but uh, yes i'm with team seven barrows but um vincent and Stephen very much teaming up um, with Bryony Frost, Paul Nichols, and the reigning champion Frodon on to get the job done uh, in that big one. What a contest that is. Really looking forward to that assignment. Um, elsewhere on the card, of course, we'll just look at the, the, the grade one action at 155 is the Corto Star Novices uh, chase. Grey one action over the three miles. Now, this race has cut up to a pretty small field. Uh, well, we've got Brave Man's Game, your five to six favourite. Ahoy Senor, five to four. T Clipper, 22 to one. Kiltili Briggs, 33 to one shot. I'll see come to you first. Uh, old enemies, Brave Man's Game and Ahoy Senor. Uh, lock horns again here. Uh, which side of the fence are you going? Um, this is a complete match, Ed. T Clipper has not got an earthly. He was absolutely legless a mile out the other day, and the, the horse of Snowdens isn't the grade at all. Uh, it's a complete match. I think Brave Man's Game is a very fair bet. If you can get around evens, I think that is a fantastic price. Um, he has jumped. When he went to Newton Abbott, uh, I think it was probably the best round of jumping by a novice first time I've, I've seen for, well, I mean, you're probably thinking back to sort of Alti or a horse like that. Um, Sprinter Sacra. He jumped superbly. And last time out, um, over fences that take plenty of jumping, I thought at Haydock, he was at, he jumped like a sort of three mile handicapper who's run 27 times. He was really glided around. I have my doubt. I know that a hoisting has met Brave Man's game before. I always have my doubts um, about racing in general, south to north. I, I think the south form. Um, is a stone better than North, more in fact, uh, just as I've got the same view about Irish form being at least a stone better than UK form, generally speaking. Um, so I think Brave Man's Game at Evens is a very, very fair bit. I suspect this will end up 13 or 8 on and 6 to 4 as well. Uh, I think it's an interesting market. I would say to jump to um, viewers that if you can get around even money now, Brave Man's Game, you'll be in a very good position uh, by the end of, uh, you know, by the time we get to Boxing Day, because I have a feeling the race completely fell apart that I saw a hoist and one, whereas Brave Man's Game, I do think, is the real deal. And I also think Brave Man's Game is liable to front, which is always a help round Kempton. And the way he jumps uh, should count for plenty. Yeah, interesting. I'll be with you, Germany, on this one. I, I think... Again, funny, a similar chat to we were having about the King George. Um, I, I think a hoist in your... It's a bit more of your Manella Rindo, and I think... You know, Cheltenham and three miles and a test of stamina, perhaps sort that horse, suit that horse a lot better than, uh, you know, good to soft round Kempton for Brave Man's game. He's slick, he's quick, he'll get away. And also, if you look at the quotes from um, Scudamore and Lucinda Russell, it's very much an afterthought, this for our hoist in your. They said originally, uh, I've got the quote here, Kempton would not be his track. We'll wait for Lingfield or Warwick uh, before going on to the Festival Novices. Well, they've clearly looked at it Um a week or so beforehand and realise this is going to be a, a match race to win a grade one at Kempton. So, you know, why not, considering they'd already thumped uh, Brave Man's Game over hurdles once before. Yeah, brilliant little contest, albeit a small field. Uh, moving on to Christmas Hurdle, another uh, small field assignment, I think it's fair to say. We've got a bit of a, a trappy contest for me, this. Uh, Epiton, uh, generally your 45 uh, favourite here. Not so sleepy, of course, you dead heated uh, with the Mayor at Newcastle last time out. 7-2, Tritonic. Interesting runner for Alan King, 13 to 2. Soaring Glory, 7 to 1. Glory and Fortune at 40s. Uh, Stephen, any strong view on this assignment? Well, it's a bitterly disappointing field, Ed, which is something we've said to each other uh, for about the last six months in the UK. Um, very disappointing. Um, the race that Not So Sleepy and Epitanti dead heated in at Newcastle, there was run in race conditions it was a proper blizzard i mean they shouldn't have raced the re the meeting should have been abandoned after two races it was completely unrestable now epitante is a horse with she's a mare with problems she had back issues had the operation on her back things haven't been right for about a year i don't think um these are her optimum conditions the only but is i was pretty confident she'd win to be honest i think she's got more speed than all of them not so sleepy although in under normal circumstances not so sleepy is not really in the same class as epitante but, and there's always a but, isn't there? If it pours with rain and gets heavy and testing, that is not Epitante's game mm -hmm. at all. So that, that would be a big checker to the fact um, 
and what chance she's got. I suspect the danger is soaring glory. He's a nice horse going the right way, got less uh, convictions against him, a strong traveller, wasn't suited by the run of the race last time out in a small field. Again, this could be a, a muddling small field. The only thing I suppose is not so sleepy is going to lead on his own. So I it's, it's gallop, a real, yeah, yeah and they, so they will go a good gallop. It's a real conundrum, this. On goodish ground that we've got at the moment, I think Epitanti will murder them for speed. She'll cruise past them on the bridle with Coleman motionless. There's no snowstorm. She's going to get dead aim. Kempton's her track. This is her race. If it becomes a slog in the mud, then I think I'd probably tilt towards soaring glory. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, worth mentioning the weather. Uh, at the time of the recording, there was, depending on which weather forecast you look at, between either 8 millimetres or 16 millimetres of rain forecast over um, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day at Kempton with ground at the time of recording. Good, good to soft in places. So you would think it will soften up to some extent. How soft it goes, I suppose we won't know. Uh, we'll bring in Vincent. I know he's absolutely chomping in at the bit to get stuck into the Irish action. We'll um, we'll just bring in uh, Vincent soon. Uh, Stephen, anything else on the rest of the... Uh, there's about 932 races um, uh, UK-wide on the 26th of December. Is there anything jumping off the page that you think jump to it, viewers, you really get stuck into? Well, it? you've raised a very good point there, Ed, because this is a day... Um, that I, I, I love Boxing Day because you're excited over the whole of Christmas about yeah. Boxing Day. But this is a day for potentially red in the face, hotted up, chasing, punting. When things start going wrong. Speak for yourself. Speak for well, yourself. Well, no, there's four races, four races all off at the same time. You, ha you know you'll be on the losers. You know you'll get yeah. on the losers. Just as you back the last fence faller that's 30 lengths clear at Weatherby, you'll see in the corner of the screen the thing you meant to back winning at sort of Fakenham by 300 yards, you know, at 20 to 1. <laughs> it's that sort of thing. So I would say to punt, jump to it, punters, irishracing.com punters, um, make a list in time yeah. order of what you want to do, what you're going to back, and stick to it, really. Do what the most bulk of it in the morning, because there'll be a lot of value around that. There certainly is going to be over the next 48 hours or so. These firms are pricing races up completely in the dark. There's no liquidity on the exchanges. The prices are completely mythical. It's basically odds compilers uh, having a guess up and all copying each other. So if there's going to be mistakes, there'll be a lot of mistakes. Now, to answer your question finally after that 15-minute rant, I thought Bothwell Bridge was a very interesting runner. 120 Kempton on Boxing Day. Mm. Um, I had a few quid on him when he made his chasing debut at Sandown. And he only won by a length or two. But he was parked six wide, which, as you know, with Nico, not that unusual. Hopefully, he'll get a bit close to the rail at Kempton. He'll need to. But he jumped superbly, given his inexperience, and showed a much more uh, battle-hardened attitude off the bridle than he'd shown previously over hurdles. So, Bothwell Bridge, he won't mind any rain either. I think he really goes well in soft ground. So, um, he'd be my sort of, he's not a dark one, but he'd be one I'd put up on the rest of the card. OK, the 120 at Kempton on 26. So, yeah, we'll leave Stephen to the losers. I'm going to be on the, uh, the <laughs> port, port and the cheese board, I think, it'd be fair to say, by that time. Right, Vincent, the dance floor is yours. St. Stephen's Day action. Take it away. OK, one of the big days of the year in Ireland. Um, interesting thing here, first off, is the going. We've got three meetings on. We've Down Royal in the north of Ireland. We've got Leopardstown in the middle of Ireland. And we've got Limerick in the bottom of Ireland. Currently... Down Royal has got a fair bit of rain. They're due maybe up to 40 millimetres more by Sunday. So we're looking at soft ground in Down Royal. Leopardstown is still quite good. They're st they've been watering the track, which is hard to believe. But anyway, there's some heavy showers due. They might get about 12 or 14 mils between now and Sunday. So most likely no more watering. And then Limerick is heavy. It's going to be very testing. It is every Christmas. and It's bottomless, basically. So that's what you're dealing with in the three different tracks. So what I'll try and do is we look. We're talking about the amount of races. There's 76 race hours. It's a race every four minutes and 34 seconds. It's just going to be <laughs> non-stop. The thing, thing for Irish punters, from an Irish point of view, is the fact that Racing TV have a dedicated Irish channel this time, so you'll be able to see the three Irish meetings on that. So that's a help for those who, who have access to that. So what I'll try and do is, as, as Stephen was saying, rather than going through every race over Stephen's day, um, or any of the days in Ireland, I'll try and pinpoint some of the races that might you might get a bit of value in, possibly, because the bookmakers will make mistakes here, certainly initially, and there's going to be a lot of gambles around the place. So I'll try and pinpoint a few that I've picked out anyway so far. So if we go to Down Royal first, um, the 12.48 in Down Royal, this is an interesting race, a race you wouldn't expect to be looking at. It's an auction maiden. It's for horses that cost less than 30 grand. They can't have won more than one bumper worth 12 grand. And we've got a horse in here that you wouldn't buy now for half a million, I'd say. A horse called O'Toole 
Um, it's a Simon Muneer horse trained by the uh, Simon Muneer and Isaac Swade, trained by Stuart Crawford. This horse won a bumper in Fairy House, and then it went and ran in the champion bumper in Punchestown against Kilcrute and Sir Gerhardt and split the two of them. That's some run. Um, this horse realistically be 20s on to win this race, but you never know. Some bookmaker might make a mistake in the, the heat of the moment, trying to price up 76 races. If you got one to five, one to four, bite their hand off, basically. This will win. Um, then we go on to the 123. This is an interesting horse here. This is a, an opportunity handicap herd. It's a horse called Hillary John. It's now trained by Brian Hamilton. And this is interesting in the sense that the horse was with Brian Hamilton. Uh, won a couple of races for him. I think it won a point to point, won a hurdle or something. And then it went to Warren Greatrix. Has been off the track for 13 months, but was rated as high as 118 when it was in the UK. It's back with its original um, trainer now, rate, running off 99. Wouldn't be surprised to see that being a live one now on that day. And then there's another one in Down Royal in the 158. We've got a beginner's chase. An interesting horse here called Skull, S K O L. It's the mount of Derek O'Connor here. This horse was still in front the other day. It was only last weekend in the Stratum race in Thurlis. Was still in front when he unseated uh, four from home. Could have could be one at a price, I would have thought. There's a couple of nice ones in here. Fakir Deline, Gordon Elliott, and another horse called Midnight it is. But Skull might be one that just slips under the radar with the form figures don't look great. But um, realistically, he was running a big race the last day. Uh, if we have a look at Limerick, then there's a few nice races in Limerick on Sunday. The 240 is a grade one novice chase. This is a perfect race for a bet for anyone who wants to have a bet over the Christmas. Pick this one out. It's eight runners. You're getting the each way. There's good horses in it. Gabby Nacko is the current favourite. Gavin Cromwell's uh, run really well in the Drinmore the last day. The horse I fancy in this is Lifetime Ambition. He was beaten favourite in the Drinmore. I didn't fancy him that day because of the ground. He has to have soft ground. He's going to Limerick where it's going to be bottomless. This suits him down to the ground. He's won in Limerick already uh, over the course of hurdles. He's eight to one at the minute. He, he looks an each way steal now to me because he'd definitely be involved. The trip is perfect. It's it's nearly two and a half. It's the standard trip he's been running over. So I'd expect him to be involved. And then there's another interesting one, perhaps. I know nothing about this, but I'm just reading between the lines. There's a Limerick Christmas, there's one particular trainer. This is his Cheltenham every year, a guy called John Joe Walsh. He's a local trainer down there. He targets all his horses all year long for Limerick Christmas. He never goes away from the four days down there without a few winners. And the bumper, there's a mare's bumper. He runs a four-year-old in it. It's called Callista Lady. And he won this race last year. They gambled on one in the same race last year to win it. So no doubt he's gearing up for that again. But watch his, his horses over the four days in Limerick. Don't be surprised. Doesn't matter what their form is generally, what price they are, there'll be money for them. And if you see money for one of his, definitely be on the right side of it. And then we look at Leopardstown. This is the big mm. one, of course, on Stevens's day. And uh, we start off half 12. We've got Sir Gerhardt. So that's one that everyone wants to keep an eye on. Have a look at this. Cheltenham bumper winner turning up first time over hurdles. He's no certainty in this. That's the one thing. We've got some, some fair opposition. He'd probably win. He'd be a very short price, but I certainly wouldn't be backing him in this. You've got a horse in here called Govan. Uh, it's a J.P. McManus, another Willie Mullins horse. J.P. McManus and Mark Walsh cost 175 grand from France. Could be anything is the bottom line. We just don't know. Arthur Moore has one in it called We Won the Toss. Uh, being placed in a couple of hurdles last season, so he's got experience on his side. He was placed behind Echoes in Rain and NC Muldoon, two of Willie Mullins's, but they're fair yardsticks. And then there's another one in it called Meet and Greet, interesting horse at McKiernan's. The McKiernan's do well at Leopardstown as well and Limerick over Christmas. They tend to target a few winners over this period as well. And this horse was a course winner of a bumper there last year. So he's had a recent hurdle run as well. He could be interesting. And then we've got a really good uh, juvenile hurdle. We're going mm. to get a rematch here. And um, There's only seven runners in it, which is a bit of a nuisance from an each way point of view. But we've got Gordon Elliott's Fildor against Lunar Power. The two of them ran in Fairy House a few weeks ago. There was a length and a quarter between them. I'd really, I, I really think this is worth having a bet in the, um, to back Lunar Power. He's the mm. value against Fildor. There was nothing between these two horses. I really thought coming between the second last and last, I'd no doubt Lunar Power was going to win. Fildor now, in fairness, quickened up past them, beats him a length and a quarter. But there won't be a whole lot between these two. And just at the relative prices, you're looking at 8 to 11 Fildor, 11 to 4 Lunar Power. The 11 to 4 Lunar Power looks a bet. And then we've got a grade one novice chase. Looks an absolute dead match here. Well, on paper it does, but realistically we've got Fernie Hollow. This horse should win. 8 to 11, Fernie Hollow. The, the issue is 
it's running it does a four-year-old at gordon elliott runs against it called river to tell mm. it's basically six to four but the, the difference here is it gets 13 pounds that's the issue is the is the weight difference only one four-year-old's ever won this before but of course it was trained by gordon elliott a horse called clark ham won it in 2014 mm. so again that looks a cracking race it should be good mm. to see can fernie hollow give that sort of weight away but fernie hollow according to the, the willie mullins camp is probably the best they've got yeah, fascinating. No, that's that's wonderful, Vincent. I mean, lots to get stuck into there. And uh, even if you're not having a bet, lots of pointers to the future. Of course, you mentioned Phil Dorr, the current anti-post vote for Triumph Hurdle running. Uh, Fernie Hollow, of course, up there in uh, the kind of prominence of the article. Yeah, I do wonder about that, that River Detail. Uh, it's absolutely taking defences like a duck to water, hasn't she? She, um, I think she'll give Fernie uh, some old race in that assignment. No, look, brilliant stuff. Uh, there, we'll move on to the 27th. Uh, the following day, and we'll kick off with the Coral Welsh Grand National, where Secret Reprieve uh, looks to follow up last year's win off a six-pound high mark. Funnily enough, hasn't been seen uh, since winning the rearranged um, Welsh National last season for Evan Williams. Uh, Stephen, come to you first. I mean, six-pound rise for winning a Welsh National, well, on the face of it, I don't think it's all that bad, is it? The horse is still unexposed. It's just a case of first time out, uh, soft ground. Can the horse get it done again? Yeah, it's interesting you you saying about that, Ed, because I was just looking um, at the race for the first time this morning, and I was sort of thinking in my head, that Secret Reprieve, you know how they hammer these horses who sluice mm. up in these big handicaps. I thought, well, it had gone up about 15 pounds or, you know, more maybe, because it won yeah. so easily. And the whole world was on, by the way. The whole of Wales was certainly on. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the betting markets in Wales at places like Foslas, Chepstow, are incredibly perceptive. There's some very, very shrewd owners and very shrewd trainers. Evan Williams is certainly one of them. Uh, Christian Williams, of course, another one who won the race the, work, the year previously with Potter's Corner. Another mm. lovely old stayer. I think the thing with Secret Reprieve is uh, there's contrasting points to make. The first thing is there's been plenty of money around for him. He hasn't run for 352 days, obviously a whole year off. Um, but he was eight earlier in the week and he's now nine to two. Now, that could be phantom nonsense. It's been put up in a paper or a tipping line or we'll find out uh, near the off whether it's actually he's A1, he's very strongly fancy, he's been laid out for the race. I suspect the truth may be that he's had a lot of problems. He's, not, he's missed a few engagements that they'd have hoped to have got a run into him. And I suspect you might find he might be nearer 10 than four to one come the day. It's a very, very hard race. Um, the one I like at this stage is Hold That Taut, who mm. is completely unexposed over fences, um, landed a gamble at Carlisle on seasonal debut. Um, if you, you look at the ba bare facts of that, it was a narrow win. And if you're only watching the running, um, it was quite a hard fought victory. Um, but he jumped and traveled superbly on the way around. And at that time in October, Venetia hadn't really caught fire. But in the last couple of weeks, she's absolutely flying. Um, at the time of recording this um, jump to it, um, she's had nine winners in the last 14 days, a 32% strike rate. And I think we've touched on this before, Ed, um, that she is one of these trainers. They go in streaks, completely missing all summer, tailed off for months while the ground's good at the start of the season. As soon as you get a bit of cut in the ground, soft ground, they just win all over the place. There's fortunes for them and they just win. I mean, every time you look up, she's having a win. I suspect on Boxing Day, every time you look up, she'll be having a winner. And I think this will go really close here completely unexposed, only had five runs over fences, a real test of stamina, I think, is what he wants. Uh, and I think there's loads more improvement to come. And that's not something you can say about a lot of these in the Welsh National. A lot of them have got convictions, inconsistencies, a bit to prove, or like the rest of us, they're knocking on a bit, Ed. Um, but I do think hold that thought, who's around eight, maybe you'll get 10 to one on the exchanges, should go really well. Yeah, absolutely. Hold that talk. Actually, he's been quite well supported in recent times. Uh, into at the moment, best price seven to one. Um, yeah, no surprise at all if that gamble continued with the rains arriving in South Wales. Uh, from Wales to Ireland, Vincent, is this a race you've uh, got an angle into at all? Well, I'd say rather than hold that thought, forget that thought. There's an <laughs> Irish horse that's seriously fancied here. No, like properly fancied. This has been yeah. a plan for a long, long time. Secret reprieve. Maybe there's been a plan to go from one year to the next, but I doubt it. As Stephen said, there's probably been issues there. But there's a horse in this called the Big Dog. This is seriously fancied. And um, they've been planning this since last spring. And the basic thing is this race, if, if you could design a race for a horse, this is the race for the Big Dog. He just he wants soft ground. He jumps for fun and he stays forever. 
and he's had a couple of recent runs. You can ignore the two runs. There's excuses for both, basically. The plan was here. That's the bottom line. Jamie Codd normally rides it. He's suspended, so he can't ride. So Jonathan Burke has been booked to ride it. But there's a piece on irishracing.com. If you look it up there in our news stories, there's a piece uh, up there today uh, with Peter Fahey. He couldn't be happier with the horse. He's talking about the last bit of work was very good. He said it was as good a piece of work as the horse has ever done. He's thrilled with him. This, this horse, big plan. Um, I, I'd be shocked if he's not in the first three or four. Right. And the case of the, the more the rain, the merrier, looking at his CV as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. He he won a Grand National trial in Punchestown back in February in, in soft ground as well. Beat another good horse that, that had won had run well in England prior to that. He's a big, big chance. Yeah, the big dog. A uh, big chance for Vincent Ed. Uh, generally around a 13-2 to two shot at the time of recording. Um, whilst we're on it, I was going to save it for later, but... um. I've back one in this uh, one of the old one with convictions or lack of conviction. You could say whichever way you want to uh, slice it, as Stephen would say. But um, elegant escape um, for Colin Tizard. Now you know to shelve the sentimental side of things because this race is obviously uh, run in on behalf of the you know uh, Colin Tizard's late daughter uh, Kim Jinjul here. Um, there won't be a dry eye in the house if Team Tizard can go and win this. Uh, but as I said, putting that aside and looking at the the form, elegant escape. I don't think. It's a forlorn hope here at 20 to 1. Uh, he was sixth in this off a mark of 160 when he last won in it. But uh, apart from that sixth place finish, his form figures at Chepstow read first, second, and first, including when landing this back in 2018 off a mark of 151. Well, he's off 156 here today, and it sounds like Native River is going to run off top weight, which uh, the cynical side of me says that keeps the weights down for him, if you like. So, and again, Never Horse, who comes alive when the mud is flying. So I just want the rain to keep continuing to fall. That he's 20 to 1. Uh, he had a run over hurdles at Sandown recently to get him fit for this. May not be the force of old. But again, check your uh, your each way concessions. So Stephen, something you would often flag up on this show. Mm. If you can get five, six or bookmakers have had too much sherry and start going seven or eight places in the mm. Welsh National, then... Uh, if he stayed on into a place uh, at 20 to 1, I would not be shocked. But yeah, it's always a good way to race the Welsh National. Again, keep your eyes on the weather. I think uh, up to 40 millimetres of rain forecast at Chepstow, with the ground currently good to soft, soft in places at the time of recording. So uh, I doubt there'll be much good uh, in the ground as they go to post. So something just to bear in mind this far in advance. Um, we'll go to the rest of the UK. Uh, very quickly touch upon Kempton, uh, Stephen, I suppose. Uh, the wayward lad looks on paper a foregone conclusion for Edward Stone at twos on. Um, of course, a bit of disappointment in Desert Orchid. A, the field sizes, but we're, we're saying that uh, it's just too much racing. But B, still, it's a bit of a will he, won't he uh, in regards to Shishkin actually lining up. So that race could fall apart. Uh, anything at Kempton or anything elsewhere in the UK on the 27th that we should be alerted to, Stephen? Um, I think it's it's. I think Kempton are going to be bitterly disappointed. I think there's some trainers as well at Ed will be asking themselves pretty serious questions as why they haven't run. I mean, Kempton traditionally struggles to get runners because it's usually good ground. I mean, a lot of the time it's good fast ground to be truth, and it's too fast. Um, but in this instance, it's going to be soft ground without a doubt. There's loads of rain forecast, and I don't know whether there's just a dearth of runners or they're not taking horses on. I mean, Shishkin's probably eleven or ten to run. Uh, it's probably a bigger price than that, in truth, uh, given the previous exploits of uh, Nicky Henderson at the moment. Let's hope he turns up. I mean, to be truthful, the, the Boxing Day Cup, the King George is a brilliant race. They've all yeah. turned up. It's brilliant to get the Irish runners over. It really gives it some colour and it's a top class renewal. The rest of the card is bitterly, bitterly disappointing, both in terms of quality, really, and in terms of field sizes. Um for me, um, the one I thought who was gonna would be a proper nap actually does run on Boxing Day. So sorry to come back a day, but that runs at Weatherby in the two forty five. It's a horse of Dan Skelton's called Unexpected Party. Now, this one absolutely sluiced up over course and distance. One run back, um, landing a right touch for all the right people um, on the day on handicap debut. Got walloped predictably. Went to Cheltenham. Um, finished second behind Gal Road. A lot went wrong that day under Bridget, made a couple of mistakes at the wrong time in the car park 
and did really well to sort of throw down a challenge coming to the last. Um, gone up a few more pounds. So, so sometimes these horses that have gone up the handicap without winning, people do oppose them. But unexpected parties, back at Weatherby, back on soft ground, flat track glider. I think Harry's going to go to Weatherby to ride him. I, I might be wrong about that, but I think he's, he's booked to ride him. That's a big clue. Uh, I think he'll win. I think he's a good thing. He's up against a lot of northern exposed horses there, and I think he'll glide round Weatherby on the bridle. Okay, that's on the 26th to confirm, yes, not, yeah, not the 27th. Yeah, okay, sorry, unexpected, yeah. no, that's fine. Unexpected yeah. party a day earlier. Well, I'll throw one in then on the 27th at Kempton. Um, one with some Irish form, an ex-Irish horse here. A real steal for Paul Nichols. Looks like Briarney Frost might run in the 310, the three-mile handicap. And the horse runs off a career-low mark. Uh, drops into a 0 to one forty five for the first time. Of course, uh, ran well in the Gold Cup uh, a couple of seasons ago and actually ran in last year's King George, funnily enough, uh, when pulled up. But... On paper, this is probably the easiest race this horse has run in for about four years. Uh, is a grade two winner on soft uh, from his early days. And I just thought it 14 to one uh, could be a bit of an each way play there in the 310 at Kempton. Well, so, uh, moving on to the Irish action uh, then, Vincent. Uh, lots to look forward to. Again, I think it's fair to say uh, a lot of eyes will naturally be on the Shack and Poor Soir, uh, Envoy Allen Clash that we should have uh, in Leopardstown uh, coming up at 110. Uh, let's kick off with that race first, Vincent, and then uh, take us through the rest of the affairs. Yeah, sure enough. That's a, it's a bit disappointing. Emergen Mean was due to run here, had been out on for it. Um, he's the, he was probably going to be the real star of the race if he ran, but he doesn't run. So we're left with four. There's Shack and Poor Soir, flop the last day in the Tingle Creek. You've got Envoy Allen, somewhat of a flop the last day in the John Durkin. And then you have two also runs here. Battle over Doyen and Sizen Potsy. So basically, it's, it looks a match on paper between Shaq and Porsua, Envoy Allen. I have no idea which way. <laughs> Come on, Vincent. Ooh, so Come on. <laughs> Sit on the fence, watch it, and let's hope, let's hope one of them redeems themselves. One of them probably will, but which one, I don't know. I suppose, hand on heart, if I had to be better to be Shaq and Porsua, the run the last day was just too bad to be true. He, he's won this race last year. and He beat Notebook and put the kettle on. Like, decent form he's yeah. got class form all the way through i know stephen had dealt the last day saying mm, maybe traveling to england is the issue maybe that is the issue maybe he's fine maybe he turns up and he's the real deal again envoy allen there has to be a bit of a squiggle against him now at this stage mm. Just, there's been too many question marks what three of his last four runs have been poor yeah so it's it's very difficult to know what he is but vincent what but what did um willie mullen say anything about shack in poor soir you, you've got your ear to the ground in Ireland because it looked, it looked like he sort of must have burst a blood vessel or something at, at um sand down he did he did uh, when strained he, when a he muscle was, behind there was official that line, it, wasn't yeah, it? yeah right, that was the official right. line yeah because it looked like that didn't it it was like yeah. i always remember that cheltenham festival you saw, I almost stopped watching the race at the festival last year when he was seven of all on and the whole world was on nap he sort of perfect sit jumped superbly up the inside on the bridle you, you know you were looking to see what was going to finish second and he just stopped and and it was 10 yeah. times worse at Sandown. i mean because he, yeah, he jumped, he jumped okay. I don't, he, he, didn't he did. Like, there was one or two mistakes in Santa, but yeah. no, nothing you'd say. Oh, he's out of the race because of that. Like realistically, yeah. it was just one of those. Very flat was, run, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Maybe I mean, I'm amazed he's time. running. Amazed he's running. I'm, I'm quite amazed. Then Envoy yes. Allen's running. You know, so <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Just, just very, just very quickly, just on Envoy Allen. The biggest talking point I've got of this for a quote from six months ago, saying we hope he makes up into a gold cup horse. Well, he's coming back to two miles. Uh, is this guesswork? Uh, do you think he's showing something at home which has made him go down this route? What, what, what's your take on it, Vincent? Nothing. I'd, I'd, I'd say I'd say it's just they're clutching at straws at this stage. They don't know what to do because of the way he ran the last day in Punchestown. Like, it was a poor run. They were decent enough horses that were in around them, but they're not top class with the exception of the winner, Alaho, mm. who didn't probably perform to his best that day anyway. So it's, it is a poor run. There's no doubt about it. He's, he's, he's not the second coming that Gordon Elliott has been telling us about for the last three or four years. Yeah, so I saw really... I saw him described as the new Sam Crow. Uh, I thought that was quite <laughs> amusing. Actually, yeah. like, yeah. I, 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 I quite like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite um, like that. But on on um, Monday we've got some other really good races besides that race, which will be fascinating to see if one of them can bounce back. But we've also got in Leopardstown. There's a a great one, Novice Hurdles. Really interesting horse here is this Largey debut. He mm. beat Kill Crook ten lengths in Cork the last day. Could be absolutely anything. Um, according to the, the Bromhead team, of course, it's, it's after timing, telling us after he beats Kilcrew 10 lengths that he's doing everything right at home, jumping yeah. on the book, stays all day, gallop forever. So he 
look, De Bruyne has done this before. He's plenty of them in his in his tank. Um, down the years that have come out, they look like where did they come from? But they just keep coming and they just keep doing it. So it'd be interesting to see um, how he performs. He's up against the likes of that Grangy, uh, Willie Mullins mare. She just keeps winning is the bottom line, whether it's bumpers or hurdles. She just keeps notching up the ones. So she's decent. You've got three stripes, Life and Mighty Potter from Gordon Elliott. They're two mm. fair horses. That Mighty Potter, the ground probably didn't suit it the last day in Fairy Hills. But realistically, we're here to see one horse, Largy Debut. If Largy Debut does it again, we have a star. That's the bottom line. Then we've got a big race in Leopardstown as well, the Paddy Power Chase. This is nightmare stuff from the button point of view. 28 <laughs> runners, three reserves. Um, JP and McManus has nine in it. He targets horses for this every year. There's, there's yeah. horses that have been waiting all year to run in this. I looked at his nine rather than going through all 28 because we've so many races to go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But looking at his nine, there's a couple of interesting ones here. One in particular is called Le Mesigny. It's the Bromhead and Rachel Blackmore. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is it's never run over anything like this trip on the track. It's never run beyond two miles one. It's now going for a three-mile chase. Very interesting. Maybe they've been messing with it. Maybe that was the way of getting the handicap mark was, was doing that. It's only a seven-year-old. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see this be a, a springer in the market. He's 20s at the minute. But McManus has said he has nine of them. There's another one with a lightweight called Schoolboy Hours and Noel Meads. There's definitely a big race in that someday. He's um, got 10 stone eight. Could see that run a big race as well. Um, and then if we just have a quick look at Limerick on the 27th. There's a couple of races here. One of them is the 205. It's a grade two novice hurdle. An interesting horse in this is Freedom to Dreams. It's currently a seven to two chance. This horse was off for two years after finishing second to appreciated in a Leopardstown bumper. And then he came out recently and won a Punchestown, according to Peter Fahey, in that same article we have about the big dog um, in Chepstow. He's saying this horse is working very well. It's definitely come on from the run and he's expecting a big performance. So seven to two might be a decent price that. And then 315, a handicap hurdle. There's a horse here. It could be absolutely anything. This could be one for your Christmas potentially it's a horse called donkey years and um, it's a jp mcmahon <laughs> horse trained by a local trainer down there as well eric mcnamara he'd love a winner at christmas down in limerick so with jp and this horse interesting thing here is he ran over hurdles first day out and i'd say he got away in them is the bottom line he wanted a big price he won a maiden hurdle by seven lengths from a horse called fagon bollock Who's a decent horse at Arkham Moore? Right how, how did that one get through? Yeah. <laughs> right. that, yeah. that reminds me well, of Greyhound. Um, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Who who farted? Who yeah. was <laughs> how did that get through? <laughs> but this this particular horse, Donkey Years, he won his maiden herd with seven lengths. Then they sent him over fences. He's had a whole load of runs over fences, and this is his second run ever over hurdles. He runs off 116, which is a much lower mark than his chase mark. He could be absolutely anything here. Absolutely. Okay. Well, there's like definitely one to keep. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that again. No, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to stay out of that. But yeah, donkey is probably the last time I backed a winner. Actually. Um, yeah. We'll, um, we'll, 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 we'll leave. We'll leave those ones aside. But yeah, lots for your notebook there. And of course, there is some real high class action in amongst all that as well. Uh, we shuffle on to the 28th. Of course, um, we're just going to concentrate on two biggies in Ireland here. They don't come much bigger uh, than the Savills chase, I think it's fair to say, uh, with Aplutard heading up the market around your 8-11 to 11 favourite at the moment. Uh, down to work, I've got a bit of a sneaky feeling, could run a big race here. Uh, your 8-1, to one. Kenboy, uh, 9, scores Galvin, I should have said as well, uh, around a 5-1 to one poke. Um, obviously, Manella Indo uh, won't go, etc, etc. Um, we come to you first, Vincent, you stick with this one. Is this a formality for Aplutard, or do you see a bit of a potential banana skin here for the Henry de Bromhead runner. Well, like this is this is interesting in its way. First of all, we haven't got declared runners at the time we're recording this, so we're looking at entries, but we we've a fair idea. Some of them are heading to Kempton and so on. So we've a fair idea what will run. We've got the last three winners of this. We've got Kenboy won it in 2018, Delta Work 2019, and a Plutard last year. The interesting thing here is the betting. A Plutard mm. was 15 to 2 and it won the race 12 months ago. Mm. And it's looking like being four to six this time round. Mm. It's too short a price, isn't it? No matter no matter what we've seen in the last twelve months, for me, it's too short a price. These are decent horses in here. The Galvin, he ran a cracker against Froden up in the mm. north the last day, and um, like he'd a Gold Cup winner behind him, the same horse that beat a Plutard in Cheltenham. So when you start matching those things up, it just seems like this has a chance. Again, it'll be interesting to see how Froden <coughs> and Manella Indo run. Um, in the in the race in Kempton, because then you'd be looking at Galvin and Delta Work here, saying. 
you know, maybe they have chances, maybe they haven't. Maybe the betting will be all over the place by the time this race comes along. But at the moment, four to six of two card looks too short to me. Okay, Stephen, any view on this? Well, I haven't, I haven't got a strong view, but I would say about a plus tard. I mean, that win at Haydock um, was absolutely devastating. But looking back at the form now, I, I mean, I don't like to say sort of beat corpses, but that was on that was in my notes. It, it did beat some very out of form horses. It, it was a solo trial, jumped superbly, very impressive. Um, but I doubt it beat. I doubt it's improved. Let's let's put it that way. It doesn't need yeah. to. You know, yeah. it run a screamer in the Gold Cup. It won this race last year. It's a cracking top-class horse. Um, seven from 17 under rules. Still improving. Trained by a genius. I mean, this is going to be a three or four runner race, I'd have thought, looking at the decks at the moment. I can't see it being much more than that. Um, yeah, I thought maybe which, seven. We might get seven. So you think there'll be that many? Yeah, it yeah. depends. On the, I mean, th th these rakes, small field races in Ireland, I mean, as a punter, look, I don't tend to get financially involved, but... You do seem to, they do tend to beat each other. Is that fair to say, Vincent? They take oh, his turn right. and turn about. It's tactical. Yeah. What happens when? Who gets the best ride on the day? You know, I wouldn't be rushing to take six to four on, bearing in my, mind that Henry de Bromed is probably looking at March rather than this as the main target, you know. This, yeah. this, is a, this is a race generally each year. You'll see five, six horses coming down to the last. In the yeah. Last. yeah. So, Fine margin. No, no, no matter what, no, yeah. is the bottom no. line. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, it's interesting because I, I flagged up Dow to work and um, Vincent uh, mentioned a previous winner of this race. This is his backyard. Uh, he, yeah. he, he come, turns up to Cheltenham, doesn't quite get the job done. He does have his jumping frailties, but I thought eight to one, he could be the value here. His record at this track is phenomenal. He won the Grey One Novice race on this card uh, three years ago. He got the job done in this race a couple of years ago. Yeah, you are a little bit hot in your mouth with a few of his jumps, but if he gets round, um, I think he'll run a big race and he always comes on a bundle for his seasonal reappearance if you look at his CV. So I expect him to come forward a lot from his damn Royal run. So uh, he, he's my play in this at round uh, eight to one. Uh, with them uh, also, well, actually earlier on the card, we've got the Leopardstown Christmas Hurdle. Um, again, another really fascinating contest, I think it's fair to say. Um, is it earlier in the card? Sorry, I've just lost is, the times yeah. in front of me. Yeah, it's 145. Lost. 145, thank you, Vincent. Um, yeah, of course, we've uh, another fascinating contest. We've got the reigning stairs hurdle champion, uh, Flooring Porter. Of course, we've got Classical Dream who could be seen in this assignment. Uh, he was a horse, of course, who won the Supreme many moons ago and he came roaring back to success at Punchestown. Uh, a few others in him are claims like Sada Burley and Abigadabra is an interesting uh, horse going up to three miles in the first time. Of course, he was last seen finishing third behind Honeysuckle last time out. Uh, Vincent, uh, a few in here with question marks about them. Um, oh, lots of question marks. First of all, so, so, long, is yeah, so, question, so on the on the assumption on the assumption those big four uh, do line up. I mean, which way are you going with these? Well, classical dream for me. I've always thought he was a star from before right. he won the Supreme when he ran in Leopardstown in a Grade One when he'd only won a maiden. Um, Ruby rode him that day against a previous Grade One winner. Like he was, they always thought he was a star. The bottom line for me is here. I, I'm presuming that Paul Townend will ride him. Paul Townend has been beaten on him odds on the last tw twice he rode him. This horse is a very difficult ride. And when he won in punches down the line, like he's obviously difficult to train as well. He's had, mm. he's had gaps in his in his CV. But Frouties, when he won yeah. the last time, Patrick Mullins rode him, wasn't Paul Townend, and on top of that, he wore a hood. And I'd say he's just really free-going type. He's very hard to hold. He didn't look that in his novice days, but maybe that was Ruby Watch in his prime riding him. That he, he looked like he was an easy ride, but Ruby made everything look that way. So there's a, there's a case for saying here, a horse with a hood on him, he hasn't run in a year again, or well most of a year basically and um, i presume he turns up it'd just be interesting to see who rides him will paul townend ride him or will it be a case they'll leave patrick on him patrick is a a real huntsman on a horse and he's you know a real horseman the way he rides them he rode that asterian phalange one day he'd, he'd fallen a couple of times and he rode him last year and i was sure he wouldn't get around them i feared for his safety but yet he got the horse around and um, that'd be the sort of thing if he rode classical dream i'd be i'd be inclined to back it thinking that yeah they have a plan here and um, Paul Townend on it, I'm not quite sure. Brilliant rider, but just he's been beaten on the horse twice, the last twice he's ridden. Okay, fascinating stuff. Uh, Stephen, I'll say Flooring Porter, uh, it's all kind of gone west since his big day uh, uh, at Cheltenham. But however, he absolutely hacked up in this race last year. And there is a school of thought that a uh, turn to a left-handed galloping track uh, well, plays to his strengths. I mean, tricky race to sum up, I think, from a betting perspective. 
Yeah, I mean, F Florian Porter, rain would be a big plus for him. He's a loves soft ground, doesn't he? Goes particularly well. I, I thought Abracadabra's uh, Ed was very eye catching behind Honeysuckle uh, <laughs> on season with them. That was a very strange race, wasn't it? Watching it back, Stormy Island was about fifteen lengths clear. Honeysuckle sat second, and they just the others were miles out of their ground. I mean, Abracad, I thought it was a classic sighter for bigger things ahead. Yeah, you know, I agree. and I yeah. thought he actually shaped really well. Um, he's a strong traveller. He's a very, very high class horse when the cards fall right. Um, yeah. I think uh, the market's a big clue as to what's expected on the day and who's going to turn up. Obviously, we don't yeah. know, but I think my selection would be Abracadabras. But I, he's one of those horses, Ed uh, and Vincent. I'd sooner take nine to two as they're lining up when I know he's all right than 12 to one guessing. Wow five days before the race. Do yeah. you know what I mean? I'd sooner be with the money rather than yeah. against it. Well, I'm a guesser because I've, I've already backed him. So, um, we're, and I believe Jack, returning Jack Kennedy may well be yes. on board as well, yes. which would be uh, something also, uh, a side story to definitely take note of. Uh, yeah, you're quite right though. I just see him being smuggled into this contest. And again, a few people have given him a, few names uh, shall we say over the years but he's a multiple grade one winner and you actually look back mm. at the form of that entry winning when he stepped up to two and a half for the first time he saw off buzz quite convincingly and yeah. yeah. that horse injured now but of course that horse uh, was at the time of his injury stairs hurdle favorite so yeah, yeah. unknown territory for abacadabras uh but definitely not a back number yet i think it's fair to say so right well so it's lots of um action very comprehensively covered across the UK and Ireland there, up to the 28th um, of December. But for a bit of fun for Jump To It viewers, we've compiled our our Christmas tricksy, if you want to call it that. I mean, it could be a patent, it could be three bets, whatever. It's, it's our special Jump To It uh, Christmas multiple. Uh, we put three bets in, we select one each. I'll kick off. I've thrown in Danny Kerwin, uh, who's my best bet on Boxing Day in the 120 at Kempton. Uh, a 92 shot for Harry Cobden and Paul Nichols. Uh, Shake with loads of promise on his chase debut at Channel's October meeting when finishing second. The form of that race has worked out an absolute treat. It was a five-runner race. The first, the fourth, and the fifth have all won since. And the third chased home my Drogo last time out. So the form's red hot. He's off the same mark. But most importantly, all his wins in the UK have come on right-handed tracks. So I think a return to Kempton, a track where he's won at before, is a, is a massive tick in the box, and uh, I think he's a major player. There's my case for leg one. Uh, Marie's Rock, uh, Stephen, I believe, is uh, your selection here in the 340, uh, the handicap hurdle. Uh, make your case for Marie's Rock, please. Yeah, she's a cracking mare. She last won at Taunton um, on soft ground, which is right-handed, flat track, speed track. I think this is virtually the first time since she's had her optimum conditions. If you watch her run back on seasonal debut, she was very late drifter that day in a very warm race. Uh, the horse of Skelton's Molly Ollie's Wishes won. Miranda was second. She's won since, despite getting left 15 lengths at the start. And Marie's Rock was given a very negative ride that day. I think she needed the run. Uh, she ran on strongly from the last. Then um, back into handicaps. That was a listed contest first time out. Sorry, I should have said that. Uh, into handicaps. A really hot one at Cheltenham, won by mm. West Cork. She was a Great big price. I, I think that they probably think her mark's too high to be truthful. Um, but she ran really well. She was 28 to 1, unfancied. She was well out the back. She got messed about. But she finished with running left in the tank. I thought it was another very good run. And I, I think you're going to get 7 or 8 to 1 because people are going to think her mark's too high. She can't win off that sort of mark. But actually, right-handed, soft ground, I think this is her chance. It, this is not a strong race going through them. And I think she's probably favourite on form. And you're going to get seven, eight to one, maybe with a bit of luck on the day. I think she'll go really, really well. Brilliant. That's Marie's Rock there. Uh, yeah, around the seven, eight to one mark uh, in the 340 at Kempton on the 26th. Now, of course, you mentioned earlier, uh, Vincent, you want the reins to continue to arrive. Just state your case for your selection. Uh, lifetime ambition. Yeah, it runs in the 2.40 in Limerick on St. Stephen's Day. I uh, mentioned this already. It's it's a perfect race for an each-way bet, basically. Um, Eight-runner, grade one novice chase. Lifetime ambition. I can't see it being out of the first three here, all things being equal. This horse, trained by Jessica Harrington, had a string of seconds last year, and then the penny dropped, and it started to win, and it started to win well. It won three or four in a row, and then it went doubles over hurdles, went over fences in Down Royal at the big meeting in October. And won really well that day. It beat Beacon Edge that day by I think it was two and three quarter lengths. Um, and Vanillier, um, the Cheltenham winner, was back in third. They both won since. Uh, Vanillier is in this race, but you'd expect Vanillier, I think, was about seven lengths back of um, Lifetime Ambition today in Down Royal. 
and Beacon Edge went on to win the Drinmore the next day. I actually fancied that that day because of the ground. I thought it would turn the form around on quicker ground because lifetime ambition, ambition all the form is soft ground. It won here in Limerick in heavy ground in March. That was the start of its sequence of wins. So I, I'd expect it to bounce back. It finished fourth in the race in um, Ferry House the last day in the Drinmore chase. It's, it's got a few lengths to find, eight or ten lengths with this Gabby Nacko, but I think Gabby Nacko wants better ground and he's favoured at the minute lifetime ambition on heavy ground you'll see a big difference. Well, wonderful. That's the Christmas Trixie wrapped up. I'm roughly off the top of my head. The treble pays about 350 to one or there or thereabouts. So um, there'll be a, yeah, a couple of diet lemonades in a few households. If we can cobble that one together with success. Well, that was the Christmas Trixie. Now for our official jump to it tips of the week. Well, welcome back to Jump To It. We're now going to look back at last week's uh, tips. Uh, it's fair to say the team didn't do all that well, uh, if truth be told. Uh, we'll go through these quickly. Um, we've touched upon uh, the long walk, um, the Ascot hurdle, uh, Stephen, and um, obviously Buzz didn't run in that contest. But uh, in the Silver Cup, uh, Cloth Cap ran for you. Uh, what do you make of his run? Yeah, uh, well, B Buzz, that was sad, actually, because I, th I did think Buzz very live candidate for the stairs hurdles you touched on earlier, but I think we're probably not going to see him for the rest of the season, but f fractured pelvis, I think, by the sound of it, yeah. which is very unfortunate. But Champ, of course, for he put himself in the picture for Charlton. Th that was quite impressive, wasn't it, Champ? He was. Travelled really well and then idled when he hit the front. He looked like he was tired, but he went again when they got to He's a top-class horse. I, I should think he'll run well at Cheltenham, definitely. Um, cloth cap. Ran a lot better than the bare facts of, I think he got rid of John Joe at the end, virtually refused at the last out on his feet. But he jumped left at every fence on Saturday. I think he needs to go back left-handed. I wouldn't give up on him. He might be the sort to pop up at a big price in the spring when people have written him off after that effort. Um, bets this weekend, we've mentioned them already. Uh, my betting expert, Nap, is in the 155 at Kempton Brave Man's game. He's 1.92 on the exchanges at the minute. It's a straight match with a horse in your and I think he represents a terrific price at the moment. I mean, I suspect that market's going to go one way. So probably a time to move now. Yeah. Take six to five on if you can. And in the King George, Frodon, um, unoriginal, won the race last year. But I, I just don't see that many other front runners. And I suspect Clandes Oboe is going to be a big market drifter. So if you can get six to one Frodon, I think you're going to get a fantastic run for your money. Brian, you'll lead, jump superbly. Soon have a few of them out of their comfort zone. More rain that falls, the better. Turn it into a slog. You saw what he did in Ireland last time out. He just keeps on grinding, keeps on pulling out. And I think that's what he'll do on Boxing Day. Absolutely. Yeah, you made a good case for both of those. Uh, Vincent, if we look back at last week, uh, we had Time Hill, of course. So we've been talking about that race at Ascot a lot. Ran pretty well in defeat. And uh, talk us through Geological's run at Dundalk. Yeah, it went all went wrong, is the bottom line. What happened with Geological was he was supposed to be a front runner, go off in front, there was a kid riding him. The problem was there was another kid riding another horse, and the two of them had off like the clappers. He never got to the front. That was the, he was the spoiler, the the spoiler as we call it. The two yeah. of them got swallowed turning in. So put a line through that. And then the other one was Tyne Hill. It was the only one, the other one that ran for me last weekend. Bit unlucky there, in fairness. Um, I had fancied him. For the fact that I just thought on overall form, he was the value in it. He was going to be there or thereabouts. He moved up long, alongside Champ. I thought he was going to go on with it, but Champ found a little bit more on the rail. I think the rail made the difference ultimately to it coming down to the last. I think if um, if Tyne Hill hadn't switched around him and had, had kept the rail, he possibly might have won. But look, he ran a cracker. It was a great race. One of the, one of the best races we've seen in a while, I would have thought. Absolutely. We're well, looking, uh, looking to brighter horizons then. What have you got for us this week? Okay, I've got a few. Um, I've mentioned most of them already. Um, we've got on Sunday, I've got a few. I've got the first one runs um, in 110 in Leopardstown is Lunar Power. I just think it's value here. The 11 to 4 is, is definitely a good price. It's against Phil Dore, who, as you say, is favourite of the Triumph. This will be one of the contenders of the Triumph, too. But um, Lunar Power, there won't be much between these two. I think at 11 to 4, you're getting a bit of value. It's definitely worth a bet. Um, we've got in the in the 145 in Leopardstown this large debut. Just could be mm. absolutely anything. This is the brown head horse. Um, I'd, be, I'd be willing to take a chance. I don't even really care about the price. I think he, he's looking like he's 11 to 4 in places at the moment. I think he'll end up a lot shorter personally, because I, I can't see any of the others be, having this star quality. The likes of that Grangie isn't at this level, I don't think. 
So then we're looking at Down Royal also on Sunday. A horse Skull, I mentioned, um, had a good run in third as the last day. It unseated rider four out in the race that Stratum won. Stratum would be different, different class to these sort of horses. Not saying this would have been a contender against Stratum, but just I think you might be able to get a bit of value on it if you can sneak a price early with the bookmakers might miss this one. And then I'd won on Monday, which is this made potential hooky horse of JP McManus, as Eric McNamara called Donkey Years. Top weight, running over her, was running the second ever time in his life. And the first day he did it, he won seven lengths on the bridle. So maybe he's a chance in a very bad handicap hurdle down in Nimerick. Okay, Donkey Years. Yeah, keep your eyes on that one. Uh, it's a good good name, more than if uh, not anything else. Um, my tips last week, well, kind of went west, didn't they, really? Although Optimise Prime, uh, I tipped him up, win only 18s. He filled the places at Ascot, a really good run for Ben Pauling. Thomas Darby just wasn't good enough on the day. Um, yeah, and the less said about my selection in the Tommy Whittle, the better. Um, moving on to this week, though. Yeah, I've got a few in here, a few chances, I hope. Uh, we've talked about Elegant Escape, I think, as an each-way play at 20-1. to 1. He's got the previous been there and done it factor. I think he could easily get involved in the places uh, for the Colin Tizar team. The Savills chase, I just want to doubt to work a little bit and a forgotten horse in there, uh, given he's got an excellent record at that track. So 8-1, to 1, I think uh, he's an each-way play. And then uh, a race much further down the line, We um, grade one action we haven't talked about, um, which we haven't. Can't really have time to talk about. I haven't had time to talk about, I should say. But he's stage star in the Challow Hurdle, Grade 1 action at Newbury on the 29th. Uh, that horse has taken him pretty much the same route as Brave Man's Game did last year. He's 3-1. to one. I think whatever turns up against him will definitely have a race on their hands. Well, anyway, I think that pretty much concludes business of this uh, bumper episode, this Christmas special of Jump To It. Uh, many thanks for you for watching at home. Uh, many thanks, of course, to Vincent and to Stephen. And, of course, uh, keep your eyes on irishracing.com for all the latest news, views, tips and updates. And, of course, don't forget to follow Stephen Harris on bettingexpert.com. Uh, whatever you're doing this Christmas, uh, please do gamble responsibly. Uh, stay safe in these testing times. Have a lovely Christmas. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.